from Microbe TV. This is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 10, recorded on September 28th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from New York City, Ori Lieberman. Hi, Vincent. How's it going? How are you doing? It's good. Hanging in there. You're seeing patients, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're fully back. Okay. Yeah, because the medical, first year medical students are just virtual right now, right? Yeah, everyone's, like no one even moved onto campus. Hmm. But the people in clerkships are back. Yeah. They're back. Yeah. All right. Also joining us from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hi, Vincent. Hi, Ron. How's How it going? Guys? Hi, Jason. Hello. From Nashville, Tennessee, Aaron Calipari. Hi, everybody. And from New York City, Andres Bendeski. Hello. Everyone seems down today. Is it me? <laughs> You're all like, <laughs> nah, nah. Are you getting tired of COVID? <laughs> yes. yes. You guys, I'm excited. Yeah. You guys are the people I see outside of like my lab members and my husband. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I see people. <laughs> so I'm just like excited. You're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Could be worse. Yes. So your yeah. lab is not running yet? We're like 50% right now, but most of like the meetings are virtual. So I spend like all day long on Zoom. So I'm uh, always, it's always nice to see people in a less kind of let's get this meeting done setting. Yeah. 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 No, well, it's getting during, I mean, the, the semester started. And so like, I think last week I had 40 hours of zoom meetings and it was just <laughs> oh, at the end of that, I was just, yeah, I'm, I'm going insane. <laughs> I don't know what, what about it, the, the lack of actual personal contacts getting to me too. But, um, uh, Aaron, I did a, a virtual seminar last week at uh, Knoxville, university of Tennessee, Knoxville. Oh, awesome. I, was, I know it sucks that nobody can travel because I feel like yeah. all of these people that I like love are coming, like giving virtual seminars in the area. Normally I would like meet up with them and now it's yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was supposed to visit because it was last year arranged and it's too bad. Yeah, I was actually, I gave a talk there three weeks ago. So yeah, I also would have visited. Yeah. yeah. It's great down here. The great thing about being down here during these times is you start to realize there's a lot more space and <laughs> places to move around, lower population density. So it's it's kind of nice. Cody and I went to um, the botanical gardens the other day. And so it was we got out of the house for like our first time in like six months. So that was good. <laughs> so Andres, are you going into the lab now? Yeah, I've been going almost every day since the end of July. So yeah, not full time, but a few hours a day, and yeah. So yeah, I go. Uh, yeah. I go three days a week now. Stay mm -hmm. the whole day because it's not worth going back after a while. But um, <clears throat> yeah. we get some some SARS-CoV-2 funding. We're trying to hire a technician with it now to do mm -hmm. some uh, COVID nineteen stuff. Well, but we're still well, I just still have one person in my lab so we've she's been coming in and Ori knows Amy uh, she's been coming in the whole mm -hmm. duration and it's just me that went back we it was funny we got an email from one of the higher up admins about a month ago he said you know well I I understand you would like to run your lab from uh, Tuscany or Napa Valley you really should probably start coming in <laughs> <laughs> yeah like I wouldn't mind going to Napa Valley, yeah, but I can't. <laughs> Where am I gonna live? Or Tuscany, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would pick probably Napa Valley, although now it's probably all smoky. Right now, know. yeah, not not cooking good. Do you have smoke <laughs> in Utah, smoky. Jason? You get some smoke over there? We did. Yeah, we got a lot of the California smoke. Um it just mm. came all the way across. So uh, Wow. Yeah, I mean, not, not as bad as the, as in California, but yeah, it was yeah. pretty bad. I talked to a guy in uh, Fort Collins today. He said they have forest fires there, and it's making it all smoky in Colorado. Yeah, Colorado's also been hit. So yeah, we're on both sides. There, there's actually been a couple of fires in Utah, but nowhere near as bad. Hmm. All right, well, this is all doom and gloom, so let's get cheery. <laughs> we have a very cool paper 
uh, that Jason's going to walk us through today. I even understood parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's got a little bit of everything for, for everyone. And, uh, but yeah, I can, should we, should we just launch into it? Yeah. Um, so this is a paper in cell uh, called Microglial Remodeling of the Extracellular Matrix Promotes Synapse Plasticity. Um, and this is a group from UCSF led uh, by Anna Malofsky. And the first author is um, uh, Fine new, uh, Nguyen. So um, let me just give you, I guess, context to, to this paper because it's um, this is this is my area of expertise. This is sort of what my lab is uh, also interested in. And that's basically, um, you know, what, what's the molecular substrate of learning and memory? And um, the, for the most part, the, uh, we've been studying, you know, neurons and synaptic connections between neurons with the idea that a specific set of neurons encode information and they're active during learning and then the, there's a consolidation process that turns uh, the short-term information encoding into long-term, but it's those active neurons that become incorporated into the memory and that circuit that is formed during learning is called an engram. And so you, you may see that in, in this paper. Um, but sort of a new uh, angle to, to all of this is that we know that in the brain, of course, there's not just neurons, there's these glial cells. And uh, there's two types of glial cells. There's the microglia and the astrocytes. And neuroscience has kind of ignored the glia cells for a long time, even though there's more glial cells than neurons in the brain. <laughs> uh, and that's mostly because uh, neurons do all the uh, the fun stuff like, you know, electrical conductance and, and, uh, and the synaptic connections. Um, and so, but in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, it's, it's obviously become clear that uh, you need glial, glial cells for, for many functions in the brain, including um, things that we would not have uh, really expected, such as memory. Uh, and and um, this paper adds a new uh, signaling ca signaling uh, pathway to that um, idea. Um, and sort of the other thing that I liked about this paper from the get-go, um, which some you know which Vincent you may have picked up on was that there's a lot of crosstalk or a lot of overlap with the immune system. Mm -hmm. So the same kind of molecules that are important in the immune system have also been adapted and used in um, in the brain. And yeah. so if anything, you know, part, part of the nomenclature is just a matter of historical precedence. So, you know, someone found a, a protein in the brain and then they're like, oh, it must be a brain pro protein, mm. but you know, you can find it in the immune system and vice versa. Yeah. I wasn't aware of to the extent that the immune system interacts, but, I, but microglia are basically immune cells. So it makes sense, right? Right. They're, they're exactly. not just so there. A, you're not there just to protect the brain, but they're obviously involved in other things, as we'll see. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, it was considered that the microglia are the immune cells of the brain in that um, they're very mobile, they can, and they can get activated by inflama inflammatory responses. And so um, most of the ideas behind what they were doing in the brain were related to disease contexts uh, and not so much just basic proper, mm -hmm. you know, functions of the brain. When was this uh, realized? How recently that the immune system was involved in synaptic formation? Yes. I mean, it's pretty recent. So mm -hmm. um, actually it was, it went back to some real cool work by Carla Schatz at Stanford and they was they were l looking at the visual system and how the visual system wired up during development, and they stumbled on the fact that there was MHC molecules in uh, in neurons, hmm. which was a big surprise because everyone thought, of course, that T cells don't come into the brain usually. So why would you have MHC molecule? Um, and what they found was that in fact, if that the MHC molecules were doing something at synapses. And if you knock out that pathway in the brain specifically, you messed up synaptic function and synaptic plasticity. Uh, so that was the sort of first idea or sort of 
not going against dogma that the these immune uh, system molecules could actually function in the brain. Um, and then Ben Barris's group really pioneered uh, the astrocytes and the function of astrocytes and function of microglia in in sort of the brain function and his disciples uh, really led by Beth Stevens at Harvard now have pioneered these um, different directions in glial cell biology. So why would uh, there be MHC on a neuron? Because normally that would be recognized by CTLs and kill the cell. So you don't want to do that, right? Right. Still not clear actually at the molecular level why uh, that particular molecules on hmm. um in neurons and and in fact there's there's different it's type 2 mhc and uh there's a repertoire of different ones in different kinds of cell neurons so um but yeah it's hmm. not actually that clear hmm. so she she was uh she came as like a visiting scholar here for six months out were you here when andres when she was here yeah she was on my floor yeah, yeah. oh yeah and yeah. so i um she told the story of how she discovered that I think it's MHC one was up like was involved in synapse formation, and she essentially did a PCR screen for ex- activity to, like regulated genes, and it was like the, the high, it was the high like most highly regulated gene that they found in their sample, hmm. and they spent like year like two years ignoring this hit, and because they didn't want to deal with kind of what it meant in terms of the immune system in the brain, and then eventually they kind of put it together and it's a really nice story and she, i think she has some recent work which she should hmm. looking at the receptor and it's not like a classic C, like t-cell receptor that is binding to it in the brain right right exactly oh. um all right but so going back to this paper and uh, specifically um and so you know one question was um if there's crosstalk between neurons and microglia, what are the signals that go from neurons to microglia and vice versa? Uh, and one of the functions that has been shown for the microglia is actually to refine synapses, remove uh, synapses and prune them during development. And, and there's a hypothesis that also this happens during uh, learning and experience dependent uh, plasticity in the brain. So so one one function is... Um, of microglia is you know, basically removing synapses from circuits so that you can refine the, uh, the final um, circuit that mediates memory. Um, and so they, they sort of launched into this by looking at this particular cytokine called interleukin-33. Um, and the, it had been known that the, the, that this uh, interlo- this cytokine could be expressed actually in, in um, glia cells, and but they had developed a reporter mouse, so a mouse that had a, um, a way of basically showing where this particular cytokine cytokine was being made in the brain, and um, they used that that reporter to see where where IL thirty three was being expressed in the hippocampus of um, this mouse brain. And so the hippocampus is the is the no, is known to be the site of where you make new memories. And if you uh, get rid of the hippocampus, um, there's uh, the, basically you 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 stop the ability to encode new or consolidate new memories, uh, at least in in terms of the sort of associative classic uh, spatial uh, memories. And we'll get into a little bit of how they measure that in mice. Um, and so that's why they targeted the hippocampus. The other sort of interesting thing about the hippocampus that they get into in this paper is that uh, it's one of the few sites that you actually have neurogenesis, so new neurons being born in the adult brain. So of course, during development, you have all these stem cells that come that become neurons uh, to wire up the the brain, but um, during an adult, there's very few sites that you can actually have new uh, neurons in the hippocampus is, is one of the, 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 those sites. Um, and again, the sort of hypothesis is that these neur- new neurons are incorporated into the hippocampus um, in an experience-dependent way, and they are in some way regulating um, memory formation. And uh, anyway, so they, so they show, using this reporter system, 
that surprisingly in the hippocampus and specifically in the dentate gyrus part of the hippocampus that um, IL-33 is being made in neurons, not the glia. And, um, and that the expression of IL-33 is regulated by experience of the animal. And they show that by uh, putting mice either in an enriched environment. And so, again, these are somewhat deprived mice because you put them in a home cage and there's, they, it's not like they're in the wild and they're running around um, wherever they want. Uh, and so an enriched en environment in this case is basically just putting some toys in their cage. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so that's, and, and so that's, um, that's how they, then so with the enriched environment, they saw an increase in the in expression of IL-33. Hmm. And the way they deprive the animals further is that they actually socially isolate them. So mice are pretty social animals. And, um, and in this case, they, they, they single house the animals, which is kind of mean because they really don't like, hmm. they really hate it. There's a lot of really cool social isolation data too and like developmental periods and when you socially isolate. So my grad work was looking at adolescent social isolation and how that causes long lasting changes in the brain that affect kind of future behavior versus adult social isolation. But it's, you know, it kind of brings up the whole COVID lockdown thing. Yeah, too I was going to say, we must be... Uh... Social isolation affects uh, our brains and how we process information in the environment. So we must be down regulating IL thirty three, right? During <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the vaccine will fix it. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're making our brains less plastic. That's that's that, and that's not a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's funny, I was I was in Sweden um in twenty uh I don't even remember what year, but I, I passed a farm and uh, there were two horses and the, the person taking me around said you're not allowed to have just one horse in Sweden. Because they get sad, you have to have two of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, actually, we have a we we have a new faculty uh, member yet, yeah, Marielle Zelikowski, who's really working on that. It's her, her whole um, research research program, and she also showed that when you socially isolate these mice, that males get super aggressive. Like they really they get. Hmm. so aggressive that when you put them back into their um, old home, you know, family environment, they, they pick fights with everyone. Uh, so that's also, I think, talking to the, the COVID situation right now where everyone's just pissed off. <laughs> so the time, the time scale of this is uh, weeks, right? Yeah. That's, and that's a good point. This is um, quite a long uh, s progression and and uh, a lot of the experiments they do in this paper are over weeks, um, so not a an acute uh, kind of experiment at all. And in the discussion, they contrast that with other immediate early genes that are that come very like come up much faster, like FOS and ARC and stuff like that. Exactly, right. yeah. um, and it's been known that there's there's sort of waves of of, of gene expression after learning, um, and some of the least known sort of functions of these gene programs are the ones that are much later. And, mm -hmm. you know, wh why do you need weeks um, for these, these genes to be expressed and what are they doing? So this is, um, I think, an awesome, interesting aspect of the paper. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the timescales we knew at least about in the brain, right? Like those intermediate or like developmentally, we know more and acutely, but this weeks long hmm. time scales, it's been very mysterious what the mechanisms are exactly. for learning or ch changing behavior generally. Yeah. yeah, well, I think part of that's because it's hard to kind of focus on them, right? Because you have that first wave of tran transcription, and then that affects not just like single other things, but kind of other secondary entire networks. And so, like, how do you isolate only one versus the other? And I think that's kind of where I think we're starting now to get the tools with a lot of the big data pipelines to look at kind of time dependent network kind of recruitment. But I think before it was really hard. I mean, like you would have to know what you were looking for with microarrays or PCR. And now we can kind of do it in an, uh, the unbiased way that I think is necessary to do that, but it's still expensive to do the time course you need to do to kind of pinpoint those two together and how yeah. they're interrelated. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're collaborating with a group at Penn, Jennifer Kremens, to look at some of this as well. And, you know, the, 
the one experiment is like a hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, what? It's insane. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And if you want to look, I mean, one interesting thing, right. Is to take like the later genes, gene networks and do like upstream regulator analysis to try to figure out what led to what. And then you're talking about manipulations followed by another hundred thousand dollars. And so I think we're starting to get the tools to do this, but we're a little ways off for it being affordable for the the, the, the smaller labs. So you have to yeah, be a normal exactly. size lab. So you have, you have to be a Hughes lab basically to do these experiments. Yeah. 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 This is why I'm, uh, this is why I stick to one gene. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So, so experience and so experience regulates IL3 expression. And then they also show that where um, IL3 is being expressed correlates somewhat with new neurons. And so they see the same kind of uh, distribution of protein with experience in, in new neurons. Um, and, and so they, they, they sort of hypothesize that potentially IL-33 is being expressed in these plastic neurons, the neurons that are sort of primed for um, encoding memory. Uh, so then they move on and they try and figure out, well, is there a unique population of neurons that IL-33 is, uh, you know, really identifying? And I, I would say, you know, in this case, so they, do, you know, they sort of throw in the, the RNA sequencing because that's the hot thing. I wouldn't say it's really telling us much, but they, they do show, show that, um, again, there's sort of plasticity genes that are also being induced at the same time in the same cells as IL-33. So it sort of does suggest that, um, that IL-33 is being expressed in the, in the plastic neurons. And then they start to uh, look at the, the, the sort of properties of these neurons, uh, including looking at spines. So um, synapses on excitatory neurons have these spine heads and they look at the density of spines and the number. And so they, they show that in the high expressing IL-33 um, neurons, you have more spines, there's more um, dense spines, but those spines are philopodia-like, which, um, which is sort of the, these thin spines that are considered um, weak, weak spines or sort of pre, uh, immature spines. And this is, um, we'll get into that later. Of what that means? Can you um, um, could you just tell us what what's the significance of spines? I mean, what is it, and what does it mean? Yeah, I mean, so so uh, really, it's the postsynaptic side of, of of synapses on excitatory neurons, and it's thought that the that one way to change the strength of those synapses is to make them bigger or smaller, and so there's actual structural changes that uh-huh. occur that you can you can measure as well as functional as in there's more receptors at bigger spines and less receptors at small, smaller, smaller spines. And so one um, big theory is that the long-term substrate of memory is encoded in the structural changes in these spines and that some, a subset of these spines uh, are maintained at that sort of uh, size throughout your lifetime or mm-hmm. the lifetime of that memory. Got it. Um, but I will, I will say that, uh, you know, one of my criticisms here of the paper is that there's a lot of the size effects that they see are fairly small. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is fairly common to when you look at spines, because one neuron can have thousands of, of spines. And so you can get really high statistical significance, but um, it's always interesting to see what the f- fix size in, is in a lot of these um experiments so well, it's also nice to usually have like a readout of actual physiological activity right it's because the, you know you can have increases in spines that don't actually form connections and there are all kinds of things about silent synapses and things like that so i don't know thinking about what this means for you know integration of across you know signals or physiological activity of the cell i always like to kind of see the ultimate readout although it's kind of nice to have every level right like morphology function behavior um but yeah, no, spines I think are interesting, but I do usually like to see kind of how that changes the way the cells and circuits signal rather than just whether they're increased or decreased. And yeah, then they, I think they do that in the next figure. They do, but yeah. It's a diff- yeah, yeah, they look at minis. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And, and these days to get a cell paper, you kind of have to do that. <laughs> um, but you have to have all these levels of analysis. So 
Um, and, and exactly, in figure three, that's where they um, they continue to um, sort of probe what these IL-33 expressing synapses, uh, uh, neurons are doing. Um, but they also start to look at uh, the microglia. And, and so they wanted to see, do microglia in the same uh, area of the campus express the receptor for IL-33 because it's known that IL-33 is, is released or secreted from, by neurons. Um, and indeed they, indeed, they do see that microglia contain the receptors. So that's good. And so they, they sort of hypothesize that maybe these neurons are releasing something to tell the microglia to then uh, remodel the synapses on those neurons. Um, and now, know how it's released. So, is it like, is it through some sort of like almost like vesicular mediated mechanism? Is it like stimulus dependent? Is it you know how how does anybody know anything about kind of that process? Um, good question. So, I, I mean, I think it's, it's it's a traditional cytokine, and so it's it's released um, as potentially as a. As a, as a full protein, I'm not sure if it's cleaved or anything, but I don't think it's fascicular. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't really know. They don't go into the signaling cascade, but and presumably they probably do know some of what's going on there. Um, yeah, it's just it's coming from me who sometimes studies peptides. And so, you know, there's all kinds of cool data showing that circuit, certain kinds of activity can bias towards releasing certain molecules, but not others. So thinking about kind of how these are regulated gives you this kind of interesting dynamic range for thinking about how certain activity patterns could basically bias towards certain kinds of areas or patterns of changes in morphology or spines or microglial activation rather than just yes or no, which gives you even kind of more dynamic range. So I think there's a lot of cool stuff, especially with immune signaling, where you have kind of a different kind of signaling than neurotransmitters. And now, I mean, in this paper, they mostly use expression, like mRNA expression, essentially, or promoter-driven activity as a readout for IL-33 expression. But it it would have been pretty cool to look at extracellular levels of IL-33. And I think that that's what, Aaron, what you're getting at here. Right, right. Yep. I'm not sure how you would do it, but it would be cool. Well, but now with all the optical sensors, I mean, I'm sure yeah. there will be a new one for that sometime soon. <laughs> um, no, exactly. Uh, they don't really get into that too much here. But they, what they do start to look at is is the function of the, the signaling pathway, and they use um, conditional IL-33 knockouts or conditional uh, the IL-1RL1 IL, IL, IL what a mouthful, uh, receptor um, as well. And so they they knock out um, IL-33 in neurons and they knock out IL, the receptor in microglia and they start to see, and they see the same phenotype, um, which is that there's overall less spines um, in these, these sort of plastic um, uh, neurons. There's changes in the, the structure of the spines. They become more... Um, uh, immature and thin, and then they they also look to see um, when they enrich these mice. So when it's no, it's it's known that if you enrich mice uh, along with new uh, neurons, you also get an increase in the density um, of um, uh, spines, and what they they and that's what they see in the wild type um, mice. But they don't really see an increase in spines with mm. um, when they knock out the receptor or the uh, IL-33. So the experience-dependent changes in spines seem to be uh, regulated by this pathway. And then they do do some electrophysiology where they record directly from slices from these um, animals. And again, if you look at, like, so this is figure three, KLM, um, they, they see a frequency in, in the change of frequency in these mini EPSCs, which are basically just the very sensitive way of measuring individual synaptic um, connections and the strength of them. And the frequency just tells you um, how many synapses there there are that are active. And so it sort of correlates with the spine number. And so they do see a decrease in the overall frequency of um, events. It's just in, there's changes in synapse number. But if you look at it, it's very... You know, it's a very small effect, um, significant, but small. 
So that's a knockout. That's the loss of function uh, approach. And then they, they also take a gain of function approach where they uh, overexpress the IL-33, in this case, in neurons again. So they have a promoter and they use a viral approach to only express it in neurons. They express it for a couple of weeks. And when they do that, then they see the opposite effect where they see more spines um, and um, that, that this this is blocked. Um, I don't know if they actually look at the experience dependent changes, which is, which I maybe it's in a supplemental. Um, so now they have their toolkit. They they have a loss of function and a gain of function. But what is the what is the effect of this pathway on actual memory? And so that's what they t turn to now. Can I ask you a quick question before we move on? Yeah. And this is so this is kind of a big picture, like philosophical question of neuronal microglial interactions. So in theory, a lot of this like synapse formation, synapse elimination should be spine specific or cell specific or dendrite specific. And they show very nicely that IL-33 expression is like correlates well with immediate early genes. Um, but one question that I have in this paper and in other papers from like Beth Stevens and Ben Barris is how then that specificity is conferred to the microglial activity. So you can imagine that if IL-33 is just secreted into the extracellular space, that maintaining kind of like spatial control over that and microglial activity would be pretty challenging. So I was wondering like if, how you guys think about that. And, and it's easy to explain how a neuronal intrinsic remodeling program could be connected to activity, but it's harder to explain how microglia can respond to that. Yeah, no, that's it's a great question. Um, and we've actually been thinking about that a little bit too. Uh, and so one hypothesis is that the specific synapses that are that need to be eliminated have a tag on them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, Stevens' group sort of showed that some of this, again, immune system or um, innate immune system, the complement cascade, uh, somehow tags the synapses for elimination. In this case, though, there's no evidence for that. They're, they're basically, as you say, they they just show that IL-33 is being released by these neurons, and and then they'll show later on that it, it somehow affects the ECM. Um, but there's no synapse specificity, and so that's a big question at the end of the paper. Where that, what is what is the role of this pathway? Is it more of a you know uh, maintenance effect that you just need this pathway to sort of maintain overall numbers of synapses? Um, and, you know, homeostasis of synaptic function is a really important aspect of memory encoding because you want to keep um, the overall outputs of these neurons constant. So, yeah, we can get back we can get back to that question. But the synapse specificity is, is definitely a, a big question in general of how the microglia are targeted to synapses. I think here it's, the synapse specificity is important, but... There's, it's not clear how this would even give you a cell, a whole neuron specificity. How sure. would you mark yeah. a, even a, a neuron if it's secreted and this one has IL-33, the one are next to it doesn't? How it would need to be tagged to the neuron or maintained in the membrane or otherwise it would activate elimination in all that neighborhood or ECM but remodeling they, yeah, in the neighborhood. Yeah. But, they imply, but they imply a cell autonomous mechanism in figure two, right? right? So it's, exactly. so it's very so, so there yeah. is some some cell intrinsic mechanism, but it, it, it's just unclear to me how that works. Yeah, I think I think their idea, yeah. which they don't really explicitly state, but they suggest is that the ECM itself is sort of trapping um, either the molecules mm -hmm. that are required or the, the microglia in some way. So that the ECM is is perhaps limiting the travel of these released factors. Which it I could also be that IL-33 correlates with something else they're not measuring. As you say, that it's tagging the neuron and IL-33 is important, but something else is actually mm -hmm. marking the individual cells and it's downstream or in parallel to IL-33. That's mm -hmm. true too, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yep. And, they, and they show that there's a bunch of other yeah. um, released ECM factors as well that are right. ma being mm -hmm. made in the same cell. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so in terms of the behavior that they use to, to test memory, um, this is a very uh, common paradigm. It's basically an associative memory paradigm where they um, associate a shock. So they put an animal in a, in a box or a, con a, different, um, a different kind of um, cage, and they shock the animal, and there's cues in the, an in the, um, in the box 
either smell or some visual cue um, or even the sound. So basically a bunch of different cues so that the in the end, when the animal is shocked, it associates the shock with that specific context, that box. And so, in, in, and so here they've got context A where uh, that the mouse is shocked and then the context B, which is completely new uh, and so-called safe um, context where the animal's not shocked. And so it doesn't take a lot of shocks for the animal to uh, associate that um, context A is bad and context B is good. And the, the way that we, that sort of, we measure the amount of memory is somewhat crude in that when, when mice are uh, afraid, they freeze, so they don't move. Hmm. And, um, and, and so the output of this is the percent of freezing that they can measure in these animals, um, which in itself is, you know, I don't know what, what, you, what Andreas thinks about that, but it's, it, it can be used in a very sort of crude, crude way because it's only one way of measuring what the animal actually knows about the hmm. um, environment. Well, and it's not controlled by the animal. So it's, it's a hard to tell if the animal, I mean, in these cases, like without controls, it's always hard to tell if the animal actually knows what's going on or not. I'm a reinforcement person though. So I like to see that the animal knows. Yeah, you like the more complicated behaviors. I mean, the thing is, the answer is easier. I mean, it's complicated on the front end, but you know the animal knows what's going on because they have to do something that they wouldn't do normally. But uh, That's true, that's true. But fear conditioning is easy because the animals learn really quickly. Yeah. So it's it, a little... The, you you win some you lose some yeah, yeah three exactly. three shocks it's crazy yeah it is really crazy but also I think one of the, the downfalls of this is you lose a lot of dynamic range mm -hmm. because animals learn so quickly that it's really hard to look at differences in learning trajectory and the other thing is a shock isn't really an environmentally like it's not an evolutionary evolutionary conserve kind of stimulus. So you, it, it can, it's good in some ways, but like, for example, if you had subtle differences in like learning ability or speed, you probably wouldn't pick that up here because the animals are going to learn that this is bad so quickly that, it, that you kind of lose that, that range. I mean, for this paper, that's not their goal. I think that's fine. Yeah, no, I mean, all very good points. And I think um, what's happened in neuroscience is that, again, like to get these sort of high profile papers, people have to throw in behavior and fear conditioning has become the, the you know, soup of the day where it's so easy to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> would it be uh, it's hard to interpret because some of the data here how they're plotting it i would not interpret it the way that they're interpreting it i i agree right in what way um, or, um well why don't we explain the data and then you guys can pick sure. it apart yeah. let me ask um, you let me ask you first uh, would it be better for them to do a maze type learning thing or was because that there they're not freezing right they're going after food do they they probably learn in three tries right the yeah, there, there are there are maze like spatial um, uh, try you know behavioral paradigms, but they're just they're just harder to do and they take longer for them to learn. I think good easy tasks that people overlook are things like novel object recognition. It's like a really simple form of learning, super mm -hmm. simple. Does the animal remember that they saw that or not? And I think that it's a little bit your interpretation is a little less. There's a little, little less up for interpretation because it's like, yeah. does it interact more with the new thing or less? Hmm. And so I think sometimes for these simple things, I, I wish people would use maybe more simple learning paradigms, things like habituation or something that's just a super simple thing rather than some of these complex. I, I think here they're also trying to match it to the timeline of IL-33, which was weeks long. So the novel object might be more difficult to do in two right. weeks or four weeks. So they're trying to see yeah. something that yeah, matches I, those timelines. But right. Also the... Exactly. Also, the sec the second to last author came from Renee Hen's lab, and they like they have worked out a lot of like fear conditioning, the the role of new of like neuronal like birth in adulthood. So that so I think it's like building on a long body of work in that way. Yeah, right, exactly. So well, let's let's sh quickly sh talk about the data. So they they look at day one after the learning paradigm, and they also look at day twenty eight, which is you know quite quite a long time after the the learning paradigm. And they measure the amount of freezing in context A, which is the one where they got shocked. And, um, and of course, this is a probe test. So they put them back in the same uh, context and they just measure the amount of freezing. And then they also measure the amount of freezing in context B, which is supposedly a quite different context where they shouldn't freeze. And, um, and so then they take the ratio of how much they freeze in context A versus context B as being 
how much they learned to dis discriminate between the two contexts. Um, and so they show that in wild types animals, the amount of discrimination loss above uh, random chance for the 28 days, but in the IL-33 knockouts, in the hippocampal knockouts, there's, you start to see a decline by, uh, around day 14, and then there's quite a significant decline at day 28. So, they, so they're saying that learning is intact in these animals, but that the consolidation of the memory uh, does not occur, but it's a really slow, so a lot, most, um, p most per perturbations that, that, that you would look at for consolidation, at least in, in the campus, people look in, you know, hours to, to days, but not 28 days. So this is an interesting phenotype in that it's really this long, um, longer term uh, consolidation, what, what, what is now referred to as remote memory. Um, but, but the way they're plotting it is really just um, the ratio of context A to context B. And there's, so, you know, um, I think this is where you guys probably uh, appropriately think there's different ways of interpreting that data. Yeah, so, so here's the thing, like, so, so there's some actually kind of cool data that people have worked out in the addiction field where you can induce in vivo LTD and specific inputs to the nucleus accumbens, and you can see really different behavioral phenotypes. So there's different situations where let's say the animal remembers something happened, but doesn't remember exactly where, right? So you have two levers, the animal discriminates one, you lesion some area. And now what happens is the animal knows something happened, it's pressing everywhere, but it's not discriminating spatially. You would see the same kind of thing as this. Like for some of these graphs, what it looks like isn't necessarily that you're losing the freezing to the conditioned stimulus. What you're doing is you're increasing freezing to other stimuli that were kind of associated around the same time. And so, I don't know, I guess I would like to see, it's a, you don't see this kind of rundown of freezing over time. You're seeing an increase in freezing to other similar but not identical stimuli. So the question is, is this affecting things like generalization where animals actually have conditioned responses to similar stimuli? You can test it. Again, this is kind of outside of the scope of a paper that's this broad. This is not their goal. I think it's interesting because it shows that these things affect learning and the longevity of kind of how this information is being processed or stored over long periods of time, which I think is sufficient for this. But in the future, it'd be cool to see if it's affecting specific types of learning like you know, recon reconsolidation at earlier phases, generalization, like learning and tasks where animals actually can control their environment. What parts of learning is it controlling? Um, right. right. I mean, to be fair, they do they do say that the that this could be uh, generalization. You know, that there's an effect specifically in generalization. It's not necessarily on um, you know the actual recall of the initial context A. Right. But it, as you say, it, using this paradigm, it's hard to determine what's what. Yeah. Yeah, this will be important when they try to figure out if it's specific to a specific spine or the whole neuron, and those specific inputs will be important at that point or environments yeah. rather than this general memory. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, this kind of could be cool because what if it is generalization? What you need is actually pruning of specific spines so that you get selective memory versus others. I mean, I think this is kind of like the, yeah, the yeah. first part of a bunch of really cool experiments on this topic going forward that's definitely outside of the scope of what they're doing. Right. Um, and then they sort of take a slight detour, and I'm wondering if this is whether they were asked to do this or what, why they did this, but uh, figure five, they now look at aging. And so um, now they, they're comparing three-month-old animals to 18-month-old animals to uh, look at memory and the expression of IL-33 with the, the idea that um, that IL-33 IL itself, it, it could be involved in the decline um, in cognition that you see with normal aging. So they show in uh, young versus old that there's less IL-33 being made. Um, and then they also show that the in this the, the fear conditioning task, old mice just don't learn as well as the, um, the young mice. So then they take a, so again, a function approach and say, okay, well, can we restore some of this function by increasing IL-33 expression? Um, and so they do that and they see restoration, a little bit of, of, of the spine phenotypes that they would see in the old animals. Um, 
And uh, I think what's surprising here is that uh, they don't they don't do the behavior. Like they don't show that uh, they can restore some function um, in the learning task. They they just look at these other proxies like number of new neurons or number of um, uh, immediate early gene expressing neurons. Um, so they don't take that final step, which I think I would have liked to see. Um, so you think this okay. is going to create a uh, an, a market for IL-33 tablets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that's why I think the, that's where they, they know, that's probably where they're, they're part, part of where they're going, I would say. Um, but I think the immune system has like, are these kind of immune regulators? I think they have a little bit more and, and maybe I'm wrong because I'm a little outside of this field, but it seems to me they have more potential for kind of therapeutics because they're more of global regulators of function like this than like blocking glutamate signaling, by the way. Right. Like a lot of our like, like drugs have focused on, Oh, let's inhibit dopamine. Let's activate D2 Mm. receptors. Let's block D2 receptors. And these have wildly aversive effects. People, even the drugs that work are like, nobody complies with them. And so, you know, this is kind of seems like something where you can kind of modulate something that's ongoing rather than just like, block signaling or activate it. So I, I think there's a lot of potential there for kind of targeting these, the, especially with things like allosteric modulators where you're not just activating or inhibiting. But I don't know. I think there's a lot of potential for this for a lot of these kinds of like brain disorders. They do yeah, mention no. that uh, recombinant IL-33 helps in a mouse model of Alzheimer's. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah I, I didn't have time to really delve into the the, hist- the literature here, but yeah, exactly. I think there's um, precedent for some of the mm-hmm. ideas here. Um, and in fact, I guess, you know, in the next, um, so this sort of aging, the, the reason why I find it kind of interesting is that they, they go to this aging idea and then they, but that's it. Then they go back to, okay, well, what is IL-33 actually doing um, to to regulate the synapses. And, and so here they took an experiment where they, they basically just inject IL-33 into the brain um, and then look at gene expression to see what goes, what goes up and what goes down. Um, and that's where they, they find these um, ECM-specific uh, proteins that lead to the idea that maybe what, one, of the, um, one of the functions of this pathway is to regulate the extracellular matrix. Uh, and it, there's, there's definitely precedent for this idea in that um, the ECM contains these chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans that uh, can regulate synaptic function. Uh, high levels of these C- CSPGs basically inhibit activity uh, and it's thought that some of these windows of plasticity are controlled by the uh, expression of these uh, ECM molecules. And actually, if you get rid of them, you can restore plasticity in adult animals and you can um, prolong plasticity in, even into an adulthood. Um, and so that's that's kind of what they're doing here. And then um, they also want to see if the microglia have some sort of role in um, in the ECM remodeling. And so what they show in G and I think, yeah, G, is that um, they label these microglia and then they label the ECM and they see that there's overlap between the processes of the, of the microglia and the ECM. And so they, they then sort of interpret this as, as saying that maybe microglia can uh, actually engulf and remodel the ECM itself. Um, and that these engulfments or these overlaps don't really happen as much with in the IL-33 knockout. So it's sort of correlative. It's not, I would say, definitive evidence that, that the, the actual ECM itself is being remodeled by microglia, but it's, that's what they're sort of pointing to. And, that, and then the, the IL-33 in some way is um, either directing this or it's... Um, as as Vincent said, sort of um, you know allowing some other molecule molecule to be expressed in in um, in the ECM, and um, and so that's that's pretty much it um, for the paper. I mean, so that so basically the the model then is that 
um, with experience, you get expression of uh, IL-33 that either signals directly onto the microglia or it goes through the ECM and that uh, the microglia then help to remodel synapses uh, either through you know, this pathway or, or indirectly through the ECM remodeling. Um, so, you know, throwing up a few new ideas there is the ECM remodeling by microglia. I, th- I would say this is, I think this is the first, um, I, you know, study to suggest that. And so that I think that's pretty cool. Um, but going back to the, the actual memory phenotypes, you know, I think, again, it's sort of interesting that they don't see a lot of effects on learning itself really uh, in these knockout mice. It's really that sort of retention of information. And that does correlate with um, this idea that neuro, that these neuro, new neurons, the neurogenesis that occurs, um, there's t- it takes time for them to be incorporated into the whole uh, circuit. Um, and that plasticity paradigm where they're looking at spines on these new, new, gener- you know, new neurons suggests that maybe um, you sort of need this slow remodeling of the circuit so that it, it uh, functions properly. And I guess that's their, their main um, hypothesis. So they, they say something in the uh, discussion that re- resonates with me because I'm trying to picture how these changes are occurring. And they say it has been proposed that memories may be stored in the pattern of holes in the ECM. <laughs> yes. And mm. I'm, I'm, I mean, they well, say, I you like know, that. these contacts. No, no, no. So that's why I wanted to ask you guys what you thought. They, they say the contacts of the microglia with spines, the microglia could locally clear the ECM and that would give these holes. So is there any validity to this idea, you think? Yeah, this, and this idea... It was actually proposed by uh, Richard Chen, um, who's not a, really a neuroscientist, but uh, <laughs> you know, is Nobel Nobel laureate. And um, at the time, he put out this paper that was more just hyp- hypothetical and theoretical. And you know, everyone, all the neuroscientists was like, "Nah." Um, I would say this is the first one of the first papers that suggests that there may be a mechanism for doing this. Mm. But one of the big uh, criticisms is that the ECM itself is. Um, there's not a lot of it in in the brain in adults. There's 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 patches and there's certain circuits that have ECM at high levels, but for the most part, um, there's not a lot of ECM, and it's also hard to uh, get specificity. So the holes, you know. So my idea would be, in fact, that the that it's still synapses that are the the, the specifying the the engram, the so-called circuit. Um, but it's the ECM that's maintaining the structure of those synapses for as long as you need them. Mm. And that um, there's some sort of crosstalk between maintaining those synapses for long periods of time versus allowing them to be plastic again. And that's where I think the ECM comes in and it sort of solidifies the synapse. And that if you get rid of the ECM, now you get uh, plasticity again and you can... Um, mm you know, fine tune the circuit. So the holes, the holes are sort of, I think the holes are where the synapses are. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the interesting thing too, is when you see stimuli over and over again, you always get this kind of recall and then reconsolidation again and recall and reconsolidation. So it gives you kind of a way to refine them as well. So each time you encounter another stimulus, you want to have plasticity and then reconsolidate what you needed and what you did it. And each time you get more and more precise as actual behavior gets more and more precise or predictions get better and better. And so, I mean, it's a really important mechanism, right, for being able to quickly remodel something and kind of solidify it again and remodel it and solidify it again. And kind of how many times you go through these cycles also dictates kind of how difficult these memories are to kind of get rid of as well. So, I mean, it's a kind of interesting interplay there, right? And each one of them, if you get rid of them, you get, you can disrupt memory. Yeah. So, and, and I should probably sit back and say, um, you know, for the, the non-neuroscientists that, uh, you know, we always think of memory as some, some, some sort of a videotape, but in fact, uh, of course, what you're saying about reconsolidation is that basically every time you recall a memory, it gets updated and it gets changed. And so this is why eyewitness testing is so bad because one, it's easy to suggest uh, changes to that memory. And two, the context of that, the way you remember that memory is completely different by the time you've recalled it like 10 times. Um, 
other than like the really stereotype memories where it's the opposite problem, like PTSD, um, where you can't get rid of the context of that memory. It's always stuck with you. Um, so, you know, so this reconsolidation idea, this sort of remodeling of memory, uh, I think is a key new-ish concept in, in memory research. Another interesting thing that I thought, that like I found in this paper was they mentioned briefly that IL-33 expression is actually non-neuronal in other parts of the brain besides the hippocampus. So suggesting that this may actually be a hippocampal specific mechanism of memory formation. And hmm. I, I always like that because I feel like we're always saying, oh, what happens in the hippocampus happens everywhere in terms of synapse formation, synapse plasticity. And I love it when that's when it's different. Yeah, no, I th also thought that was interesting. And in fact, we're, 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 we're trying to figure out, you know, so um, for most memories, and this includes humans, if you get rid of the hippocampus, you can't make new memory. And that's why in Alzheimer's disease, the first thing that happens is that you are unable to make new memories because the hippocampus is the first target. But those old memories, those childhood memories, those long lasting remote memories, they're intact. And so the last thing to go is the sort of first memories that you make um, as, a, as, a, as a child. And so the idea there is that the ultimate storage site of those memories is the cortex, not the hippocampus. And this, uh, this transfer of um, information from hippocampus or um, the consolidation or the final storage is called systems consolidation, which is confusing. But, um, but ultimately, we know very little about how the cortex stores the, 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 the lo those remote, those long-lasting memories. Um, and so in, in mice, at least, in, the, in a lot of these behaviors, um, it seems like th this month window is where you need uh, the hippocampus, and then after that, you don't need it. I can't remember a thing from my childhood. I'm not even that old. <laughs> so what are you talking about? <laughs> this long-term memory. I was going to say the opposite, that I was thinking about what was my first memory from childhood. And I, I'm like pretty sure that I don't actually remember it, but people have told me over and over again uh, stuff that have, has happened and you've yeah. been incepted with these memories. Yeah. So that's what you're calling remote memory stuff that in humans would be many years ago. So in the yeah. mouse, a month is enough to make it a remote memory. Is that correct? Yeah, I think this is where it, it gets fuzzy because yeah. in the hippocampus, the there's... Uh, I, I would say at the end of the month, then, you know, you could still disrupt consolidation, but afterward, after a month, it becomes harder to do that. Mm. And so they're calling um, this memory that they're looking at, you know, between three and four weeks uh, in the hippocampus remote. But I would, I would say it's not really remote because it's still hippocampus dependent. Oh, okay. do, do they think that this IL-33 mechanism is also active in the cortex where you said the the other memories are as well? Well, this is where it's interesting because they, what they show in the cortex is that it's mostly being made in microglia, not in neurons. Um, and so it's probably a different a different kind of process out there. Um, and that's why I think that there is a big black box in, in terms of the cell biology of information storage. Mm. Um and there are other important places like the amygdala where some of the types of memories are showing like freezing and context are mm -hmm. also in, plays a key role. And I don't know if IL-33 is expressing the amygdala or other places that have LTP and remodeling and or if it was hippocampus specific, as we're saying. Right. No, I think they should. Well, I was going to say different aspects of memory are also kind of encoded in these regions. So like, you know, you have things like salience or valence that are, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't necessarily have to have the kind of spatial memory and things like that. So you have all these brain regions that are working together through these different modulatory mechanisms to connect the dots mm -hmm. into a place that dictates what is the memory? How important is this? Is it good or bad? How do I use this to guide information or is this irrelevant? And so there's all kinds of different forms of learning, right? That, that use not, I want to say the same mechanism, but similar forms of ensemble and engram recruitment versus plasticity mechanisms and remodeling. And they all kind of are interconnected. So it's complicated. Yeah, Good complicated, because sure. then we have jobs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think this makes it even more fascinating if each part of the brain has a different cellular mechanism for synaptic remodeling and, uh, and such. Yeah. 
Well, I think it's, it does because that's the way. That's a great way to make drugs, right? That target one aspect but not another. Like you know, if you want to sure. enhance memory but not get rid of old memories, like you want to mm-hmm. have some mechanisms that are selective for specific parts of the process. And so it'd be pretty cool if this was really selective to one region or a couple regions or cell type or something like that. Or change declarative memory but not implicit memory or procedural memory. Yeah. Right. So apparently, IL thirty three is in in a lot of different cell types all over the body and is involved in a number of uh, human diseases. And there are SNPs that are associated with, so I just wonder if there are SNPs associated with, you know, memory abilities in humans or something like that. But the the cool part is that this protein can do different things apparently outside of the CNS. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this is a common theme as well. Many of these cytokines that are these <clears throat> inflammatory cytokines, like even TNF alpha has um, a specific role in synaptic function in, in the CNS. And so I think it's just evolution has decided that it's going to use these, yep. you know, different uh, signaling cascades in, in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. I was intrigued by the Alzheimer's, the aging issue. And I wonder. I don't know how they gave it to these mice if they injected it or what, because I would think that feeding it wouldn't do it, right? It's going to get digested in the gut and never get anywhere, but. Yeah, in this case, they injected into the cerebral ventricles, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 But there are some there are some papers I think that like from UCSF also that showing that if they take serum from young mice and inject it peripherally into old mice, they can enhance memory and cognition. Huh. So there are some peripheral factors that are affecting memory formation. Yeah. So, so you think... Yeah, uh, there's a paper from three years ago from uh, Jer Crescenti and Eric Kandel mm-hmm. showing that a bone-derived protein calcitonin enhances memory. Yeah. So, and also from young mice. Into, yeah. it's, a, it's a nice paper, yeah. Hmm. yeah. All right. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, sure. That was good. I enjoyed yeah, that very much. I learned. Uh, Let's see if we remember it in a week or two, <laughs> <laughs> or a month. Yeah, or a month. I don't know I'll what this, you guys next time. <laughs> I find, and I, and most people do. If you don't use something over and over, you forget it, right? So, yeah. I've, the stuff about viruses that I, you know, think of every week, I can remember that for forty years, but I can't remember things that I encounter once. And and then, you know, uh, two weeks, I don't know what the time scale is, but at some point if someone asks me, I can't remember. But this the memory thing is weird because I, you know, I'm aging and I forget names, you know. Um, I'm I'm not aging yet and I also forget names. I, I sometimes- We're I'm all aging. Like, not, even, <laughs> not even remember them in the first place. Yeah. I was at one of my <laughs> podcasts, Immune with Steph Langle. And I said, who was your PhD advisor again? And I know the I know her. It's uh, um, I can't remember her name now. <laughs> yeah. I've had her on Twiv, and I know she's a virologist. And so, and so she said, "Well, I'm going to let you try and figure it out." But I couldn't uh, remember it anyway. So I have these little. If I don't, there is this philosophical question of um, you know because it's so hard to know whether you lose the information itself or just get it's gone from the brain, yeah, or you just can't recall it. And usually, you just need a trigger, right? So you just need a cue, and that'll help you recall it. So oftentimes, I think that's the big problem: is that it's not that we don't have the information in the brain; it's just that we can't connect it. And and in mice, it, that's been shown that you can recall mem- like. That recall is the issue in Alzheimer's. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So it's Linda safe. I know. Until, we're- well, until until you you know you have enough cells that just died. So I think in Alzheimer's sure. ultimately you do lose the information, but that's because the early stage. Yeah. Yeah. I I take <laughs> solace in the fact that I know where to look for this stuff that I can't remember. Okay. So when Google, that go- right. when that goes, <laughs> then I'll be really <laughs> I'll be really upset. <laughs> All right. We don't have any email this week, so folks. Send in some questions. Uh, twin, T-W-I-N, at microbe.tv. You know, Twiv is getting 100 emails a day. Send some of them over to Twin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but not the ones about Twiv content. Not <laughs> the non-COVID related <laughs> ones. Yeah, you could, you could ask uh, about, you know, there's, there are neurological symptoms, as we've talked about, and you could ask about that. But not that we'll know <laughs> the answers. <laughs> 
Anyway, so twin, T-W-I-N at microbe.tv. The website is microbe.tv slash twin where we have links to the, to the papers that we talk about. And if you like what we do on this and the other podcast, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways uh, you can do that. Ori Lieberman is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center on Twitter. He is Ori Lieberman. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, guys. This was great. We were going to miss you, and we delayed it a week, and now we got – actually, you and Aaron were going to be gone, right? That's cool. Yeah, yeah we're, a full, we're a full house now. <laughs> that was great. Maybe the fir- not the first time. I think there was one other where we all showed up at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Andres Bendeski is at Columbia University. Bendeski on Twitter. Thanks, Andres. Thank you all. It was fun. Yeah. Aaron Calipari is at Vanderbilt University on the on Twitter. She is the Aaron Calipari. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everybody. Is there another Aaron Calipari? That's why you have the Aaron. <laughs> This was like a joke. This is like so funny. This was a joke because I used to watch a lot of football and all the people from Ohio State introduced uh, me right. to That's Ohio right. State University. And I thought this was hilarious. <laughs> and so uh, now everything I have has this in front of it, but it makes everyone is like, why? And I'm like, it was just a bad joke okay. like 10 years ago. Got it. No, Very good. <laughs> now Jason, you're famous. And so, yeah. Jason. Not there forever. You can't get rid of it. No. <laughs> Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah on Twitter. Jason Synaptic. Now that's a cool handle. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> and an American citizen now. Officially. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yep, Congratulations. Official. Although you probably you might want to go back to New Zealand. <laughs> it's like, are you sure? Yeah. I'm not I, sure. Congratulations. I yeah. definitely did not get rid of my passport, New Zealand passport. It's still there. <laughs> but no, I am. I'm happy to get in time so that I can vote this selection and. You know, it's uh, mm. let's see what happens after the election, but I'm hoping it, it'll be a a good a good election for many reasons. <laughs> what's, nice shirt, Jason. Yeah, what's on oh, it? Yeah. Are those neurons? So yeah, this was an, a really cool design from the neuroscience program students at Washington University hmm. uh, in St. Louis, and so it's a BLM uh, fist, but it's uh, made up of a Bakinji neuron. So the dendrites ah. make up the the fist. And um, cool. all the proceeds from the shirt were, were going to BLM and um, Black and Neuro, the um, black students that nice. are, are black, uh, scientists in neuroscience. So yeah, it's cool supporting supporting them. Are you in your office today? I am. I thought, yeah. I thought it was different, a little brighter. <laughs> and well, what what gives, uh, what gives it away here. is the whiteboard, right? Because I didn't think you'd have a whiteboard. Yes, at home. that's true. <laughs> All right. No, I, I started to get stir crazy. I, I also start, uh, went back into work, started going back into work about a month ago. So. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. <laughs>